This episode of The Minimalist is brought to you by Mountain Dew Baja Blast. <laughs> <laughs> the best flavor of Mountain Dew. <laughs> Use promo code POISON. <laughs> Just kidding. This is brought to you by nobody. Advertisements suck. Let's start the show. This podcast has bad words. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus, and together we are the Minimalists. Ryan, we all want things. Yeah. But have you ever thought about why you want what you want? <laughs> Actually, we should tell our audience, if they buy all our books, mm-hmm. especially if they pre-order Love People Use Things, uh-huh. if they watch our documentaries, yes. and they listen to all our podcasts... They'll never want anything again. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if that was true? It, yeah. If we had the answers. <laughs> and so what we're going to do today is we're going to sort of interrogate where our desires come from. Today we're joined by Luke Burgess. He's the author of One Thing. I'll hold this up if you're watching on YouTube, which is also where you can comment on this episode. This is a brand new book. It just came out on June 1st, and you can check it out now. We'll put a link to it in the show notes. We're going to discuss how we can free ourselves from chasing unfulfilling Mm. desires. Luke, thanks for being here, brother. Thanks for having me on, guys. Pleasure to have you. So ours is a listener-driven show. We're going to get into some questions here shortly, but I thought maybe we could start out by talking about why we want what we want. What are, what's this concept of mimetic desire? Mm. Yeah, mimetic's kind of a fancy word, but it essentially means that we want things because other people want them. Mm. All right. And it's usually because we feel like we lack something that they have. Mm. So our desires are not generated the way that a lot of people think they are from some secret chamber of desire inside of me where there's a one-to-one relationship between me and the things that I want. Mm. Desire, according to uh, Rene Girard, who is the inspiration behind my book, is something relational. So desires are shaped in the relationship between people, people who model desires to us in different ways. So if we're stranded on a desert, d- a deserted island, right, all of a sudden our desires are going to change considerably from what mm-hmm. they are right now. We may have some sort of innate desires, you know, food and, and sleep and right. sex. I get tired, I want to sleep, right? I get hungry, I want to eat. I get horny, I want to have sex. A- and, and yet beyond that, even, and even those things are shaped, you know, the joke of the, the Baja Blast thing, like mm-hmm. no one has an innate desire for you know, a, a poisonous drink, right? It just happens to be that that is promulgated by media and by culture and by advertising to make us want certain things that we don't necessarily inherently want. Exactly. So you make a really good distinction. If you were stranded on a desert island, if you were born on a desert island, there are certain things you simply couldn't want because you hadn't even been exposed to models for certain mm. kinds of desires, for yeah. Mountain Dew and just bullshit things that we yeah. don't need, right? Right. So you're, you're limited in what you can want. Uh-huh. So our wants are kind of circumscribed by the models that we have in our lives. So you're right. There's biological wants, but I think they're better described as needs. So, mm. you know, human being, if we're thirsty, we want to drink. If we're hungry, we want to eat. If we're horny, we want to have sex and all right. those things, right? Yeah. But once we get outside of the realm of instinctual response, How do we know how to choose one object versus another? So like the more abstract things get, the more reliant we become on models, like Mm. careers, like lifestyles. Mm. Um, The more abstract, the more we rely on some kind of external uh, signpost because we don't have a biological one. Right, and And, this isn't inherently a bad thing either. It's just understanding it helps us better understand what drives us to do what we do, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, very often we just take our desires for granted. Like, I want this thing because it's good for me. And we don't actually take the time to question why we're pursuing this thing in the first place. Yeah. And even even good for me is sort of a a cultural construct to a great extent. If you were on that deserted island and, and you were born there, you wouldn't really know good for me, bad for me in the sort of philosophical sense. You would know like pain and pleasure. And maybe that's how we identify good and bad. Unfortunately, I think right now, our desires often lead to our misery. The objects of our desire are making us miserable. You know, I, I'm familiar with your stories, and I think we all actually have a lot in common because it, early in my life, my desires, the things that I thought were going to make me really happy, made me totally miserable. Even though I had a lot of things that I thought that I wanted, I would get them, I'd be happy for a day. Yeah. And some things happened in my life 
that made me stop and pause and say, like, what in the hell am I relentlessly pursuing these things for? Uh, kind of forced me to, to stop and take stock of my life and prioritize my values and try to get to the origin of my desires yeah. and go back into my past and try to figure out where some of these things came from in the first place because mm-hmm. they were making me miserable. Yeah. Right, yeah. So uh, I'm guessing mem- mimetic desire, I mean, it's mim- mimicking is, 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 is that a derivative of mimic? Yes. Okay, yeah, it is, all right, yeah. cool, yeah. yeah. yeah awesome. so, so we mimic other people, yeah. including our desires, they're mimetic. It, it basically, when we talk about the concept of mimetic desire, it just means, you know, the, the question I often ask people is, do you want what you want or did someone else tell you to want it? And almost mm. always it's someone else, not a literal person, but a culture, society, religion, et cetera, that has influenced our desire, right? Yeah, and in this aspect of human nature, and I do believe it is part of what it means to be human, is not a bad thing, like you said. It's, we're social creatures, right? right. Uh, we care what other people want. We're influenced by the people and models in our lives. And that's what allows us to enter into like beautiful relationships. And there can be positive models of desire. Yeah. If we have negative ones, we can take an inventory of the relationships and we can swap them out for positive influences. So the idea that we're mimetic is a little unpalatable to some people yes. because we live in this hyper individu- individualistic age, right? right? Where it's like, no, I'm not mimetic. Actually, one of the, uh, somebody read my book and was like, yeah, this isn't for me. Like that, this applies to everybody else. Like I'm not influenced by this stuff, right? I'm not, in- but it's like, no, I mean, we're actually at a deep level. Like you have to understand this is not a bad thing, mm-hmm. right? right? Like I want to be influenced by positive models of desire in my life. Right. Yeah. And, and so if you think it's not for you, it's probably most for you because that's the, the final illusion is like, oh yeah, it does look like everyone else is influenced by everyone else. Yeah. Except me, I'm different. I'm, I'm unique. And what you're saying, and I know you even talk about this in your book is uh, that, that sort of, the, uh, the dissolving of that illusion, it takes a while for us because yeah, maybe it's hubris, maybe it's e- the ego, whatever it is, it leads us to say, well, well, no, I- I'm different. My desires are my own. Mm. Everyone else's desires are, are, well, they might be influenced by someone else, but you know, I'm better than that. I'm stronger than that. I am a good person or whatever it might be. Yeah, I'm not a follower. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> Look I'm, at all I'm, these lemmings and pawns all you, around me. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Conversely, like I think about people, I don't know, I went to high school with, maybe some adults like this probably too, but they look at what the cool kids like and then they automatically like eschew that. Oh, the cool kids like this band. I don't like that band. I like this. Yeah. So not not only are you uh, you know mimicking, but then you're like choosing a group of people that you don't want to be like. So you're choosing the opposite of what they choose in a way that is kind of a mimetic desire. It is. Yeah, isn't I mean, it's it? like kind of like nobody thinks they're a hipster, right? That's what they're right. doing. Is right. They're rejecting the popular <laughs> culture, and then they all kind of end up looking alike. Right. 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 Yeah. So that's something I would call negative imitation, right? You're mm. still taking the culture as a model, and you're rejecting it not necessarily realizing that it still has a tremendous influence over you. You're just yeah. imitating it or reacting to it in a negative way. Mm. Yeah. Well, we've got some audience questions here. Let's start with Facebook. We have a question from Willem. How do you find fulfilling desires? After years of minimizing in several areas of my life, I find I have very few desires left. Even though I feel peaceful and content, I miss the energy that comes with enthusiasm for something. This energy makes me think that another word could be pleasure almost. Mm-hmm. I feel like we could insert that there. Yeah, I, I agree. So, so Luke, if, if we're looking at this, you know, it's, it's fascinating because fulfilling desires. So you know, we, we often think of, you know, okay, now that I'm analyzing this, some of my desires have been unfulfilling. You know, uh, and, and we often realize that through trial and error, as you did, as Ryan and I did, as I did. And say, oh, you know what? All the things I thought I wanted isn't actually what I necessarily wanted. Or, or maybe another way to put that, this is something pithy for you, podcast, Sean, is um, the thing you want is never the thing you want. Mm. And, and so when I think about our, uh, the, the, our influences there, as we start to unpack these, what we're really searching for is more fulfilling desires. Mm. And at the same time, what Willem is saying is, yeah, but I still want that burst of pleasure as well. Yeah. We're not anti-pleasure. But, but also understanding that satisfaction or pleasure is different from fulfillment. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, want, I don't want to desire less. 
I only want to desire less of the things that will ultimately bring me misery, and I want to desire more of the things that will bring me fulfillment. Yeah. So it's a matter of ordering our desires, right? Some desire, I mean, desire is not a bad thing. Desire is beautiful. It's what it means to be human. It's yes. how we love, right? right. Yeah. So it's a matter of ordering our desires and discerning which ones lead to where. So yeah. what I would suggest to your listener, uh, maybe a good place to start is to kind of take inventory of your past, go back in your life and ask yourself, you know, what were those things that I did? What were those actions that I undertook that did bring me a deep sense of joy and satisfaction? Mm -hmm. I dig them up and try to string together three or four of those stories and see if you can identify some pattern to what it was that brought you fulfillment. Mm -hmm. Because that's probably a, a little key, a little signpost to something that really matters to you and is truly meaningful and is probably going to guide you to the kinds of desires that you want to cultivate in the future. Why do we yeah. why do we stray off that path though? Because we find something that's fulfilling and then we always want more and more and more. In our culture we never stop to consider less of just about anything, right? It's it's constantly consuming and and constantly wanting and assuming that more desire equals good or inherently noble or something. And that's not what we're saying. We're also not saying get rid of your your desires. It, but it sounds like we find something fulfilling, and then for whatever reason, we, we tend to stray from that. Is that because we're of the external influences still? Mm. Yeah, you know, we tend to, it's like almost a flaw in, in human nature, uh-huh. you know. Uh, we always think that we lack something in order to be happy. Mm. And we go through life. The reason that we adopt different models is because we think that they have something that we don't have. Mm. You know, this, especially if somebody's really confident in what they want and confident in their desires, mm. they become a very powerful model to us. Another mm. word for that might be idle, right? Yeah. Yeah. And as soon as we get what they had and we're not happy, mm. we just assume, well, maybe they were just the wrong model. But guess what? There's, you know, what? seven and a half other billion models in the world. So now I just go in search of a new one. Yes, and that's yeah. a game that just never ends. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Wow. Well, I'm listening to a copy of Wanting. It's Luke's new book. Uh, enjoy that book. We have a question here from, Sh- is it Shay in Arkansas? Yeah. I decided to design a way to pay off my debt as soon as possible um, based on your advice that no debt is good debt. Um, after running this plan by some trusted family members, Uh, I received some advice that paying off my house as aggressively as I had originally planned might be bad um, because it might not leave me with enough cash on hand should I face some sort of financial crisis, either personally or nationally. Um, I was interested in what your advice is on a proper balance of paying off your mortgage quickly um, while making sure you have enough cash on hand uh, should you face any kind of extenuating circumstance. So, Shay, you're you're right. We often say that there's no such thing as good debt. In fact, we were just on Dave Ramsey's show um, a few weeks ago. And, and, but people often mistake that. When we say there's no such thing as good debt, what, what does our mind stray to? Well, all debt is bad debt. Well, what I mean is there's no such thing as morally good debt. I'm not saying that it's morally bad to have debt either. What I'm simply saying is it removes pieces of your freedom. And so if you desire to have freedom, as I do, but then I also might desire to have a giant house, well, I... They're mutually exclusive. If I'm going to have a massive amount of debt here, it is going to tether me to something which, by definition, removes pieces of my freedom, right? Mm -hmm. And so, while I never want to have debt, I don't want to have a a, a big house with a big mortgage. I don't want to have a car payment. I certainly don't want to have credit card debt or payday lender debt. The the debtor is slave to the lender. I I believe that. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that I'm telling you or prescribing to you that you should do something and there is a morally right way to approach these things. Because I think in a weird way, Luke, that would be a type of, you know, mimetic prescription in a way where like, I, and by the way, I think we're smitten with these sort of the how to's and the prescriptions from all over the place. And then we get all of this sort of conflicting advice and we just end up confused. Mm-hmm. And so I think maybe the, there's a question sort of behind this question. What do you actually want? If you want freedom, 
then of course I'm going to work to pay that house off as quickly as possible. If you're comfortable with giving up some pieces of your freedom, then maybe it's not that big of a deal to you. Mm -hmm. You're also worried about having enough cash on hand for emergencies. Well, I mean, of course, having an emergency fund is something that I have uh, three to six months. I, I try to have six months of, of income so that if something were to happen, the internet explodes, or you lose a job, whatever, all of a sudden you have the ability to still provide for yourself for a period of time as you sort things out. Again, that's not what you should do. It's just something that has worked for me. And it's, I know it's worked for Ryan and thousands of other people as well. Yeah, for sure. I think like what I hear Shay kind of uh, showing us here is that when we have these desires, we have to be very clear on what those desires are going to cost us. So for Shay, it's going to cost her uh, liquid uh, funds to um, to cover an emergency if one should happen. So yeah, I think that's I think that's great. But you know, maybe there is a broader question here with how do we filter through these desires? Is it just a matter of weighing out the opportunity costs? Is it a matter of like looking at our values and, and looking at our beliefs and deciding deciding what what desires are going to serve us? Um, but I guess like, do you have any advice on sifting through all of these desires that? That, that come into our lives? Mimetic desire, one way to think about it would be borrowed desires. Like a highly mimetic desire, you're sort of borrowing desire from somebody else. Mm. So in my life in 2008, when I had this really crisis turning point in my life, my sky high level of debt was basically a proxy for my level of mimetic desire. Mm. Okay. Yes. So there's some relationship between that debt <laughs> and mimetic desire. Mm. And for me, this is a very personal decision, right? Personal yeah. finances. So I just went through a process of saying, what's really, really important to me? Why did I buy a house in 2008 when I really probably shouldn't have because I just moved to Vegas and I wasn't quite sure what the next year was gonna hold. I bought it because like owning a house was what I should be doing. Because yes. mm -hmm. I had a certain level of success, I needed to have a certain house with a certain you know amount of square feet mm -hmm. and a backyard and all this bullshit, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. You'd be irresponsible if you didn't. I mean, we hear all these sort of yeah. cultural memes, which are the, the, they themselves the, the drivers of mimetic desire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, here I was left holding the bag on this right. big house when the real estate market crashed and it was bad in Vegas, but right? But it one was of the worst. It was yeah. one of the worst. And I just had a moment. I was like, I don't, I don't want to be in debt like mm -hmm. ever yes. again. Mm -hmm. So I made some really important decisions at that particular time in my life to you know, to shed myself of all debt, all credit cards, um, mortgages. I'm not a, an investment advisor here. We <laughs> probably need to do some disclaimers. Sure. Um, but when interest rates are low, from what I understand, it can make sense, right, to, to, you to, know, to, to, to carry the mortgage, right? Yeah. It, it, I, yeah. it can make sense monetarily, but just yeah. because something makes sense monetarily, it doesn't take into consideration the, the sort of non-monetary costs, right? The, mm -hmm. the psychological costs, the emotional costs of, of owning the thing. You have to take, I mean, your psychology matters a lot. And yes. when I, I talk to a lot of people about stocks and crypto and should I invest in this, should I invest in that? Right, right. And everybody wants to get into the technical arguments. And I'm just like, if you buy that, if you put X percentage of your money in that, will you be able to sleep at night? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is no, like what's the cost of that on your relationship? Yes. Yeah. We don't talk about the internal personal stuff enough. Mm. Yeah, well, let's, let's dig into that a little bit more because there all, are all of these additional costs and we often think about debt and, and owning possessions. We start with the price tag and that's one cost for sure. And then we just sort of dismiss it. I can either afford it because I have the cash in the bank or you know, some lender is going to loan me the money and I can, quote, afford the payment. By the way, if it requires you to finance something, you by definition can't afford it. I mean, that's just... I, in our, our society, I know that's almost sacrilegious to say. I'm just saying definitionally, it's like numerator, denominator thing. Like if you don't have the money to pay for the thing, you can't afford it. Uh, I, that's like grandma's wise advice. And now it's it, it seems like uh, it's anathema to, to even say something like that. Right. Yeah. And, and so um, but let's let's talk about some of those other costs that, that you know, society or the mimetic beliefs or the mimetic desires thrust upon us. Yeah, there's personal and relationship costs. There's different layers of costs and it's worth examining all the different costs because the financial one is just the beginning. Mm -hmm. So early in my life, I was paying what I call a misery tax. Oh, mm. expand on that. So I would work 12 hour days in my startup 
And at the end of the day, I needed to consume things to feel better. Yes. Okay. Mm. Drinking too much, eating too much, you know, going to the strip and, you know, just pissing my money away, Mm. playing blackjack or whatever it was. That was basically a misery tax that I was playing in order, paying in order to feel better about myself to go to bed and wake up the next day and do the same thing all over again. And those things, right, there was a personal toll to that that added up, like not getting enough sleep, right, impacting my health. So the financial cost of me, you know, going out to some fancy dinner and, you know, ordering, you know, fancy cocktails for all of my friends and everything like that, you know, was not cheap, but there was a a more personal cost that I had to pay uh, in regards to my health. Uh, my well-being, um, you know, relationships that I wasn't cultivating. Yes. Mm. Just to buy things to help me feel a little bit better about the things that I didn't really want to be doing during the course of the day. Ah. Wow. Misery tax. That is, that's huge. It makes me think, I makes me think about this advice I got one time from a friend. He basically said, you know, anything you do in life, you have to ask yourself, like, is it serving you in, in the way, uh, in the person that you want to become? Or is it taking away from you? And uh, that, that there's something there with the uh, with the oh, what did you call it? The uh, the misery tax. Yeah. yeah, and and that's it's kind of a. I mean, that's another way to look at it, I guess. Like anything that we do, you've got to ask yourself, like, is this actually serving who I want to become? Right. And if it isn't, and you're going to do it anyway, and you're acting off of impulse, that's when it becomes a misery tax. The misery tax is like the zero sum game. Mm. It's like just trying to help you get to the next day and just deal with a life that you're really not happy with. Yeah. So I think we have to kind of evaluate the things that, like the way that we spend money through the lens of who is this helping me become? Mm-hmm. Right. And the longer view we can take, the better. 10, 15 years from now, will I look back at these decisions after they've compounded mm-hmm. for years, who will that have helped me become? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, and, and so in, in a way, what we're talking about here is, is this helping me become the person I want to become or is this Forcing, forcing me to become the person someone else wants me to become mm. or a group of others, a collective others want me to become because that's just going to continue to make me miserable. Speaking of money, Shay, I'm going to send you a copy of our new book. It comes out next month. It is called Love People Use Things because the opposite never works. If you want the book book or the ebook, we'll send those to you. Or, or if you want the audio book, Ryan and I are going to read it to you, Shay. We're <laughs> personally going to come to your house and read the entire book. It's a live audio book session. <laughs> Uh, in fact, uh, it's a relationship book, but it's about the seven essential relationships in our lives, how we heal those relationships. And one of those relationships is our relationship with money. We have a tumultuous relationship with money in our culture. And because of it, it's making us miserable. I mean, talk about a misery tax. Our relationship with money is is one of the things that breaks up relationships. It breaks up businesses, partnerships, friendships, all because we, do, we, we have this awful, un- misunderstood relationship with money. It's created a lot of pain in our lives. So one of the chapters in here is about our relationship with money. Shay, I think you'll enjoy that. We'll put a link to this in the show notes. By the way, it helps out if you pre-order the book. If you pre-order it, head on over to lovepeopleusethings.net and you can find all the different versions over there. Ryan, what time is it? You know what time it is. It's time for our lightning round where we answer your text messages. You can text your questions and comments to 937-202-4654. Five, four. Yes, indeed. Now, Luke, during the lightning round, this is where Ryan and I do our best to answer questions with a short, shareable, less than 140 character response, but not really. We just <laughs> maunder on a bit, and then we, we put something pithy in the show notes so people can copy and share our pithy answers on social media. By the way, if you text that phone number, we'll also send you our minimal maxims every Monday, a, a Monday morning minimal maxim. We'll never send you sp- spam or, or, or junk or advertisements, but you can text us anything. In fact, text us emoji of the thing you got rid of most recently, 937-202-4654. Brenda has a question for us. How do we recognize and address the influences, especially those online, that promote mindless consumption? We're made to feel as if we should have certain things because other people have them, which makes us feel incomplete. So, Luke, let's talk about the you know, these new influences we have, you know, we've been heavily mediated to for the past hundred or so years, but especially with social media. I know in the book you actually, you, you talk about how it's not really media in a way. So let's expand on that a bit. Mm. There's a lot of talk about how social media is addicting. I think we have to ask, how is it addicting? Mm. 
Now, I know there's good evidence that it is neurologically, physiologically addicting. I mean, it gives us dopamine hits. Mm -hmm. The way that the notifications appear on my phone when somebody replies to a tweet or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's like a slot machine, right? It's these intermittent variable rewards. I don't really know what it says, so I I just can't stand not to click in it. So, you know, that's true. I mean, this stuff definitely affects our our brains. So you have the Vegas Strip in your pocket now, essentially. You have the Vegas Strip in your pocket, exactly. But it's way deeper than that. Okay. Because what I'm interested in, I think what we all are in social media, it's not like a slot machine. I mean, there's other people through this device that I have in my pocket. I have access to mediators of desire. Uh that are modeling lifestyles and careers and uh, vacation destinations and all kinds of things for me. So it's not just like the way that, you know, the the, the red notification button affects, you know, my brain. I mean, this is a a very kind of materialist view of it. And I think that the problem goes much deeper than that. And that the issue is that this little device I have in my pocket is like a dream machine Mm -hmm. that's projecting the desires of hundreds of millions of people to me 24 hours a day and because I'm a mimetic creature I think we all are I need to know what other people want Mm -hmm. and that's the real power of social media in my opinion Mm, yeah Yeah, it's almost like we just have to be really careful with the role models that we choose because what I see is someone who is feeling discontent they're feeling unhappy so they go to the internet, social media, websites, shopping websites to find something to fill that void that they're feeling and they're looking in all the wrong places. Yeah, I mean, there's this phenomenon of hate watching and this is one way Mm -hmm. I think to distinguish, you know, is this person affecting me in a positive way or in a negative way? Mm -hmm. You have to ask yourself honestly, what's going on inside of you when you're following a person or watching a show uh, or reacting to a tweet or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Like. What's really getting you off? Ooh, <laughs> right? Yeah. right? Yeah. Is it is it envy? Uh-huh. Is it uh, hatred? Right. Yes. So this is a real thing, and I think we have to be honest. I mean, some people are very positive influences on us, but many times our fascination with people is because we're just constantly measuring ourselves according to them. Right. Um, and there's even a weird thing where people like to see other people like fail yeah. and get canceled and all this stuff. Yeah. Yes. And I think we have to ask ourselves like what's going on inside of us that would make us derive pleasure from people saying or doing things that are you know disturbing or, yeah. or not smart. I want to dig more into this uh, on the Maximal episode because you have a section here. It's on page 121 called The Joy of Hate Watching. And so we're going to dive more into the joy of hate watching and really understanding scapegoating as well, which you, you cover pretty extensively in, in the book. And, and I, w- I want to understand that, that, that sort of schadenfreude that we experience, the, the, the hate watching, the, the, da- the enjoying the downfall of others. And maybe we can begin to understand that, not just intellectually, but, but viscerally. So we'll dive more into mm. that as well. I've got a pithy answer for you. Actually, I've got three. We've already uh, discussed two of them. One is our desires often lead to our misery. So you can tweet that podcast, Sean. Also, the thing you want is never the thing you want. Uh, we all, there's always the thing behind the thing. Even if it's the thing you think you want, you want ice cream. I tweeted that the other. The thing you want is never. I, uh, the thing you want is never the thing you want. Someone's like, but I want ice cream. I'm like, yeah, yeah, but that's not actually what you want. You want the sort of gustatory pleasure. You want the immediate sort of dopamine rush. And even below that is is you you want the calories to sustain yourself. And maybe that's the the actual need that drives that desire. Mm. But then the, the mimetic desire is like, oh, it was a beautiful, well-placed photo shoot of an ice cream cone on the billboard that made me want the ice cream, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, one more pithy answer for you. Uh, what you want usually isn't what you desire. Ryan and I often try to make a distinction between these two. Now, I know we use these in our culture, we use those two terms synonymously. And I, I, I'm not trying to say that that we, we shouldn't do that. But quite often, understanding you know, the true desires of you know, that are sort of based on the needs versus, uh, yeah, that'd be nice to have. You know, I, like, I want a million dollars. Like, in the sense that, like, yeah, that'd be nice to have. But I don't actually desire it in the sense that, like, I'm not willing to put advertisements on this podcast because I could make a million dollars if we did that, right? Mm -hmm. And so being able to, I guess, distinguish between the two, the the sort of the the true desire that are attached to our needs versus the wants that might be attached to some sort of cultural influence. Yeah, I love that, man. 
uh, my pith answer is this: more media, more misery. Mo media, mo misery. That's right. And but here's the thing: is you know, I think about when I started down my minimalism journey. I started realizing that, you know, the GQ magazine, the L magazine, the things that I was watching on TV, it was influencing all of these desires that I had. So I think, you know, for someone uh, like Brenda here, you've really got to be careful with the media that you're bringing into your life. We all want to be entertained. It's okay to be entertained. Mm -hmm. But if we're gorging, if we are becoming a, a media glutton, Oof. then uh, it, we, we're going to have a lot of these mimetic desires that uh, Brenda's trying to avoid here. Well, my pithy answer would be follow your desires to the end to learn what it is you really want. Mm. Ah. Get underneath your thin desires and try to uncover the thick one that is underneath yeah. the thin one. Yes. Mm. To give you an example, a kid who's addicted to porn, uh -huh. that's a thin desire. Okay, mm -hmm. might get him off for five minutes or whatever it is. Okay, mm -hmm. but like, what is he really looking for? Mm -hmm. Human mm -hmm. connection, yeah. relationship. Like, keep going there, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's something that this person really wants, mm -hmm. right? Some thick desire underneath that. So, I would say, like, take take whatever th your thin desire is, and just keep exploring it and find out, like, at the end, where is that leading you? Like, it might just be. Mm -hmm. um, a, a, a veneer of something that, that you really want that might really bring you fulfillment. Yes. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So if, if you dig deep enough, you realize like these sort of the facade desires, that surface level desire, nothing wrong with those things. But if we understand what's behind those, you might find fulfillment behind those initial desires. We got so much more to talk about. But first, Ryan, you got something for us? Here are some voicemail comments and insights from our listeners. Check them out. Hi, this is Scott from Kansas City, listening to the podcast on hope. And your caller, John, who called in, said he'd gotten into minimalism and yet had not experienced the joy. Well, I would suggest minimalism has nothing to do with stuff. Minimalism is the first step in an unconscious rejection of the social contract that says stuff is the answer. Stuff at the answer of self, uh, at the expense of self, at the expense of identity, at the expense of dreams. So what John needs to do is recognize that stuff, getting rid of stuff only clears the deck and now he's free to put in the work to discover what he values, what he hopes for. The real goal is to discover yourself. My name's Susan, and I recently listened to your donations episode, and I just want to say that I work at a Goodwill as a job coach in the donation centers with adults with disabilities, and I super love my job. I love every, I love going to work every single day, and I love the people I work with. But one thing I've noticed that a lot of donors don't know about is that while Goodwill has like thousands of locations all across the nation, Every Goodwill is run locally and specializes in different local issues. So the Goodwill in my town, we specialize in domestic violence victims and people with autism. But the next big city in, in my state, they specialize with a lot of homeless populations and a lot of at-risk youth. So that's something that I would just recommend that everybody to, like, really look into your Goodwill, like your local Goodwill because you can really see on how they create a lot of local change, and you can get involved in that, too. All right, y'all. Thanks again to Luke Burgess for joining us today. You can check out his book, Wanting, and you can find him over at lukeburgess.com. We'll put a link to both of those in the show notes. But stay tuned. He's going to be joining us on the Maximal episode this Thursday over on the Minimalist Private Podcast. Check that out over on Patreon, patreon.com slash Minimalists. Real quick for right here, right now, here's one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalist. Actually, here are four things that are going on in the life of the minimalist, Ryan. Mm. Uh, number one is we're going to be looking for some podcast interns soon. Details coming. If you're on our email list, you'll be the first to know about that. Ryan needs someone to get his coffee for him. <laughs> and... Uh, I don't uh, know what else you need them to do, really. Can I just be the intern? <laughs> <laughs> no, it'd be a disaster. <laughs> uh, speaking of not disasters, man, it's been a long time in the making. I just want to say thank you for the folks who participated. So over the last few years, we raised some money and spent a lot of our own money as well 
to help build a grocery store, a nonprofit grocery co-op on the west side of Dayton, our hometown. Yeah. It's called the Gym City Market. We're going to put a link to this in the show notes. In fact, Sean, if you can put a link to the most re- recent uh, Dayton Business Journal article or maybe Dayton Daily News article, they're finally opening their doors. So yeah. West Dayton, second or third largest food desert in the United States. Man. Not a single grocery store until now. You did it, y'all. Yes. You did it. So many of you contributed a dollar. So many of you contributed dozens of dollars, hundreds of dollars, even some of you. No matter how much you contributed, thank you. We're really grateful. Yeah. We were able to raise over $100,000 with the final $100,000 they needed to really get this thing over the finish line. We broke ground a couple of years ago before the pandemic, but now we are finally opening the doors. The Gym City Market, Dayton, Ohio, not only providing healthy, high quality food to the residents there, so they're no longer just buying food at you know, the local corner store or at a McDonald's down the street, but accessible food, but also health education mm. and understanding what is going to provide nourishment to people on the west side of Dayton instead of going to a convenience store and buying processed packaged foods that are laden with seed oils and preservatives and all this other nonsense. Mm -hmm. So the Gym City Market is opening right now thanks to you all. We're really grateful. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. All right, Ryan, the third thing I wanted to cover really quick is we are simplifying our Patreon tiers. You know, when we started Patreon a while ago, uh, a long time ago, years ago, it was a per creation sort of thing. Yeah. And uh, we realized, like, it would be simpler if we could just do it per month. Right. Patreon eventually realized this as well. Now they're encouraging all their creators. In fact, the 95-plus percent of their creators on Patreon, they do a per month. So no matter how many private podcasts we put out there. So if next month we wanted to do 30 private podcasts in a month, Mm -hmm. we wouldn't charge you for every single one. And so effective immediately, by the time you're listening to this, we have new simplified tiers. Now, Mm -hmm. no confusion there. If if you're a Patreon member from before, it's not like you're paying more or anything like that. It's just we've simplified things. We want to avoid confusion. People reach out to us. Sean, I don't know how many people reach out to you, but it's dozens a week uh, reach out to us as the minimum. And they're like, hey, um, if I sign up for Patreon, how many episodes am I paying for a week? And and we wanted to simplify things. Patreon finally worked it out with us, allowed us to make that switch. Before, Mm -hmm. we couldn't make the switch. Mm -hmm. We wanted to simplify things for you. So it's great news for you. It simplifies things. It makes you confident that you don't have to worry about, I'm going to spend too much money this month on Patreon. No, it's the same Mm -hmm. amount of money every single month. It adds that consistency for you and for us. It removes all the confusion. Patreon.com slash The Minimalist. You want to support the podcast, keeps the podcast 100% advertisement free, and it allows us to do something really awesome. This is our fourth update for right here, right now. We're building out a brand new studio. Yeah. We, we just put up a, a, a before studio tour, like part one to the studio tour on Patreon. You get to see what the empty white box studio looks like before we start going in there with sound panels and furniture and set design and all these things. And there's going to be a follow-up to that as well. Jordan filmed that with me. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, and now it's up there. You can find that over on our Patreon page as well. For our added value this week, Ryan, we have two added values. I was mm. talking to you. We were in Nashville recently driving around, and I was telling you about this show. It's called Calls. It's on Apple TV+. Plus. Jordan, have you heard of this show? No? He's shaking his head no. Mm. So I I don't know how to describe it. It's a just a new innovation in filmmaking and storytelling in television if we, i don't even know if we call these things television anymore i mean they call it apple tv so i guess it is but it's not yeah. linear television that we're used to from before but this show it's these short episodic what well, the name says it all calls mm. but it's visual but it's not cinematic mm. Uh, it's graphical, but it's also based on the audio. It could be a podcast, but also it requires the visual, so it couldn't just be an audio podcast. It would be a different thing if it was audio only. It's almost like you take the best of sort of storytelling and highly produced radio and drama of a film, but then the audio of podcasts, and it's all met. I've never seen anything like it. And Bex and I turn it on, um, and the episodes are short. They're less than 20 minutes. Some are like 15 minutes or whatever. We have this little rule. We'll set a timer on the phone and say, hey, Siri, set a five-minute timer if we're going to watch something. We give so- All right, we're going to give it five minutes. 
And after five minutes, I was all the way in the rabbit hole. Mm. And, and I was like, oh, I, I want to see the next episode. And they're so short, I could see the next one. I don't want to spoil anything for you, but it manipulates. The reason you'll like it, Ryan, you're really into sort of physics and, and quantum physics. It manipulates time mm. through audio in a way that's really hard for me to explain. Hmm. Anyway, the show is called Calls. And Jordan, I know uh, being the filmmaker you are, I'm really appreciating the the innovations that we've been seeing recently uh, on places like YouTube and other streaming platforms. This is so innovative that uh, it's unlike anything I've ever seen. The storytelling, the, the, the graphics, the audio, everything, the acting, the drama, all of it. Mm. I want to play you out today with, speaking of innovating, our friend Matt Carney who we actually did an interview with over on Patreon. Mm -hmm. He has a new album out. It's called January Flower, and this is one of the singles from that album. It nice. Is, the whole thing's out now? It is out right now. Awesome. It is called Anywhere With You. Enjoy the song. By the way, we have a bunch more surprise questions this week, like how do I address my longing for things that are impossible to attain, like being young again or bringing back loved ones who have passed? Why do we want the belongings of loved ones that have passed, even if there's no sentimental attachment? Mm -hmm. Also, what did the minimalists really want? We're going to get behind Ryan's and my deep mimetic desires. One desire I even had from childhood that I've carried with me that we're going to reconcile, and, and Luke's going to peek behind the curtain with us. Plus, we have a million more questions about why we want what we want, why we consume what we consume, what we can do to help our children better understand, much, much more. If you want to hear all that, join us on The Minimalist Private Podcast this week. Visit theminimalists.com slash support to subscribe and get your personal link so that our private podcast plays in your favorite podcast app. You can follow The Minimalists on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram at The Minimalists. Come to one of our live podcast shows. Visit theminimalists.com slash tour to find a city near you. If you have a question, comment, or minimalism tip for our podcast, email a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. You can comment on this episode at youtube.com slash theminimalists. And if you want our show notes in your inbox, sign up for our email list over at theminimalists.com. You'll also receive any new minimalist writings that we put out there for free right there in your inbox. And Ryan... If they leave here today with just one message, let it be this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it